Hey everyone, my name is Anita Graff and welcome to your very first lesson with the cello. To get started, let's discuss some basic terminology. This is the scroll of the cello, this part is the neck, and this is the body of the cello. These are the pegs, this is called the fingerboard, these are your strings, this is your bridge, these are your fine tuners, and this is the tailpiece. And lastly, down here, we have the end pin. For the parts of the bow, this part is called the tip, this part is called the wood of the bow, this part is the hair of the bow, this part here is called the frog, and this is called a ferrule. Before we even pick up the cello, I want to talk a bit about how we can sit in a way that's comfortable and will help us get the most out of our playing position. It's also important to choose a chair that has the correct height for you. In general, I try to look for the height of chair that allows for a slight downward slope from where my hips are to where my knees are. When you're sitting to play the cello, you want to make sure that you're sitting straight without slouching too much or creating a angle in your spine that's too rigid. You just want enough gentle support to help you play the instrument. Of course, everyone's personal preferences and needs may differ, but in general, I think it's a good idea to look for a position where your feet are about shoulder width apart and you can stand up from your chair without needing to slide your feet forward or back or shuffle them in any way. So practice doing that a couple of times, going from sitting to standing, just to figure out where is the most comfortable position for your feet to be. Now that we're going to introduce the cello into our setup, uh, let's talk a little bit about how to choose the correct end pin length for you. Basically, now that you're comfortable in your cello chair in your seating position, when you put the cello in front of you, you want to make sure that it doesn't cause you to lean too far back or too far forward to meet the cello. You want to pick an end pin length that enables you to sit basically as you were before without the cello. The neck of the cello will rest over your left shoulder and in general the body of the cello will go down the center of your body. Um, it's pretty typical to put the end pin slightly towards the right side of your body or your right foot so that it's on a very slight angle which enables you to navigate around the upper registers and upper strings of the cello with more ease. You may also find yourself sitting slightly into the left side of your body, which will also help you to get around the cello more easily. The position of your knees is another factor to take into consideration. Usually your knees should meet the cello at about where the bottom of these curves are. Many cellists, myself included, have the cello slightly angled towards the right side of our body, so our left knee may be slightly more behind the back of the cello than our right knee is. But you can experiment with this angle with your own cello in your own space to see what's the most comfortable option for you. Next we'll be talking about how to position your arms and your hands. As I was saying before, a lot of the source of our power when playing cello comes from the entire spinal backside of our body. So I like to think of sort of the power coming from all the way through your back, through your shoulders, and down your arms and into your fingers. So for that very reason, you want to have somewhat of an unbroken line happening in both of your arms without any odd angles in any of your joints anywhere. So I think of the arm position as kind of a gentle ski slope in both arms. You want to have your shoulders slightly above your elbows or slightly above your wrists in both cases. And these angles will change slightly as you move around the cello and navigate, um, but this is my basic position that I usually return to. Um, shoulders above elbows, above wrists, above fingers. A lot of times with beginning students, I see elbows that are either too high because they're holding their tension in these joints or they're allowing their elbows to kind of act as dead weight, which you don't want either. You want to be able to have some soft support in both of your arms here in the elbows without um, consolidating tension in that area. We really want to avoid having tension in any particular area of our body when playing any musical instrument. I also often see odd breaks, especially in the wrist joints. Um, you'll see this a lot in the left arm and sometimes this or the opposite in your bow hand, this is not good. Try to avoid having any 
weird breaks so that you think of it as like someone could ski down from your shoulder to the bottom of your arm. So as a basic resting position, your setup should resemble something like this in both of your arms. Practice getting comfortable with just sitting in these positions for a while and really feeling how all of your joints and various points of connection feel. Um, it's good to just go slowly and get used to these things. It's also really helpful to practice in front of a mirror because that way you can see in real time if you're doing anything strange. Here's an exercise you can do to ascertain the starting point for how you should be using your hands in position with the cello. Um, take a moment to just put your instrument down, shake out your hands, and then flip them over, palms up. Take a second to observe how the curvature of your fingers looks, how your palms feel. Hopefully you should be in this position without much tension at all. And then move your arms into the kind of position you would be using to play the cello. Right now, my left hand and my right hand are not far off from how they should be positioned to hold the bow and to move around the fingerboard. Try that a couple more times. As you progress, if you're ever feeling tension or pain in either one of your hands, come back to this exercise just to remind yourself how your hands feel in their natural state. While your hands start from a very similar resting position, they play very different roles when it comes to creating sound on the cello. I think of creating a musical phrase in very basic terms as like speaking a sentence. Your left hand would be responsible for the words you say in the sentence, the content while your right hand is responsible for how you say those things, whether you're yelling or whispering or talking very agitatedly or whether you're very calm, your right hand is responsible for a lot of the expression. So focusing on our left hand position for a moment, we spoke earlier about having a gentle downward slope from our shoulders to our elbows to our wrists and down to our knuckles and our fingertips. Just like our shoulder is above our other major joints, your base knuckles should usually be above slightly higher than your other knuckles and your fingertips. You don't want to see something that looks like it's collapsing like this. In general, we're looking for kind of a gentle C shape in our hand. It's also very important to have your thumb in contact with the back of the neck. So wherever I'm going on the cello, my thumb comes with me. And in general, I think placing it directly behind where your second finger is, is a pretty balanced position. This may be different for you and you can experiment, but that's kind of my starting advice. Um, you wanna keep your thumb in contact with the neck, not squeezing into it and not flopping around in the air somewhere. Just always staying in contact with the back of that neck. Likewise, the area of your finger where you meet the string may differ depending on the kind of music you're playing, but a good place to start is somewhere between the very tips of your fingers and the medius pad part of your fingers. So about midway through there is about where I want to have my fingers meeting the strings in general. So practice just transferring the weight of your hand from different fingers, maybe from one to four, to two, to three, back, just practicing applying pressure to the string. And when you're pressing the string down with your fingers, you don't want to have a death grip on the cello and you don't want to have your fingers be so light that you're not getting a clear sound. Experiment with playing open strings and adding a finger and seeing how much pressure you have to apply before the note is clear. That's pretty much the most amount of weight that you need to apply to the cello at any given time. So experiment with that to see exactly what is the least amount of weight you can apply while still getting a good solid tone and uh, note out of the cello. I'll be brief in addressing the concept of vibrato for the moment because this probably won't come up in your studies until you've gained a little bit more experience and proficiency. However, vibra vibrato is what we use with our left hand to add color and expression. Here's a note without vibrato, and here's a note with vibrato. With vibrato. So while this is a 
an extremely small movement, I tend to think of it as a hinge movement that comes from your elbow. It's essentially this movement, but sped up and localized to just the tip of your finger. So as an exercise, I call this siren noises. Practice running up and down the entire length of your fingerboard, and you can make sounds if you want. And then slowly bring your thumb behind the neck of your cello. Choose any finger. And then speed up that motion and make it smaller until it's just that fingertip. So it might sound something like this. That's just to really reinforce the notion that the vibrato movement comes from further up in your arm. It's not originating in your wrist or your fingers really, but it's just a very small localized version of this larger hinge movement. Now let's talk about your right hand for a little bit. As I mentioned before, your right hand will be responsible for a lot of the expressiveness and artistic choices that you make on the cello. Um, there are some basic tenets of hand position that we can use. And like I've said before, everybody's hand position may be a little bit different, but here is a general guideline. Your three most important fingers in your bow hand are going to be your thumb, your first finger, and your pinky finger. The thumb should probably go right about where the wood of the bow and the frog meet. So about here is where I place my thumb. And I like to make sure that I'm keeping a slightly bent angle in my thumb so that the thumb is soft and not rigid and straight, which can easily happen. So make sure to check on your thumb every now and then. And if it's straightening out too much or you're locking it up, just make sure to give it a little bit more bend. Your first finger is going to be largely responsible for controlling how much of your arm weight you're allowing to transfer into the bone. And finally, your pinky finger acts like a navigator, kind of like the rudder on a sailboat, determining a little bit more about the direction of your bow. Your second and third fingers are mostly there for support. And I personally, I like to rest my second finger on the silver bit on the ferrule of the bow. And they help balance all of the fingers on your bow hand. As we discussed with the left arm, your right arm should also have this gentle downward slope happening from your shoulder, through your elbow, and down to your fingertips. Also, don't forget that your elbows are an excellent source of support. A general rule of thumb when drawing down bows and up bows is to think that your shoulder joint is what opens first, followed by your elbow joint, and then finally your wrist joint, so this motion. And then the opposite is true on the up bow. The wrist comes in first, then your elbow, and then your shoulder. So it's a great idea to start off your practice with a couple of what we call long tones, where you just play open strings, but really focus on which joints in your arm are moving at which points. So this is what I might look for when I'm just drawing an open D string and focusing on opening my arm. <laughs> times to get comfortable with that and also experiment with playing on different strings and figuring out how the angle of your arm has to change. There are many different tools at your disposal for how to bring out different colors and different characters from your cello, but here are the three major ones that you'll encounter with your bow arm. Um, a lot of what affects the kind of sound you're getting is how fast you're drawing the bow, how fast you're moving it, where you've placed the bow, closer to the fingerboard or closer to the bridge, and how much of your arm weight you're allowing to go into the bow. And all of these factors can change based on what kind of sound you're looking to get and what kind of music that you're playing. Um, but these are all things to experiment with as you're getting comfortable with your cello. You'll probably hear your teacher talk a lot about having a straight bow when you're playing the cello. And this means that we don't want to see a tip that's pointed too far towards the floor or too far back towards ourselves, we're looking for something basically in the middle. 
And a good way to figure that out is to look at your strings as a vertical axis and your bow as a horizontal axis. So your strings and your bow should basically form about a 90 degree angle. I look for that right here. And you can experiment with placing your bow in different points and always looking for that basically perpendicular angle. This will help you figure out how your bow should feel and how your bow arm should feel at different points in any given bow. So this is another good thing to practice when you're doing open long tones on your cello is to just keep an eye on the angle of your bow and keeping it steady as you go along. Another way that you'll be using your right hand as you learn new pieces won't even be involving the bow. And we're talking about pizzicato. And this is where you pluck the string instead of bow it. Um, this sounds easy enough, but there are some factors that you should take into account. There are different fingers that you can use to pluck the string, usually your first finger or your second finger, and you can experiment with what feels most comfortable to you. It also matters where on the fingerboard you pluck the string. The sound differs if you pluck up here versus down here. You get a different tone. So that's another item that you can play around with. I also like to think of um, pizzicato is moving slightly to the side instead of trying to draw the string upwards. There are a few items that it's always going to be helpful to have on hand when you go to your cello lessons. Always try to bring your rosin for your bow, a cleaning cloth to clean the rosin off of your strings, um, extra strings in case one snaps. I usually keep a mute on my cello as well. And you will want to have a rock stop of some kind. They usually come as either a standalone rock stop or a strap that connects to a chair. Also make sure to have a tuner and a metronome on hand in your practice studio and in your lessons. I talked about tuning in more depth in another video, but in general, you'll want to start by tuning your top string, your A string, either to a given pitch or to the monitor in your electronic tuner, and then working your way downwards through the other strings from A to D to G and C. I hope that these tips help you to get set up with your cello. It's so important to build a strong foundation both physically and technically, so really take the time to get comfortable with your instrument and with these basic concepts before moving forward. And most importantly, have fun!